Well, we're carrying on in our study of the book of Isaiah. Uh, the last couple of sermons uh, were about a, a grand finale, a joyous, triumphant finale. And this week, we're going to be looking at a different kind of text. We're going to be looking at um, a heavy message and a lament. You know, it's like when somebody brings bad news. And, you know, for those of us who are children of the 60s, you know, it's like, that was heavy, dude, right? And so it starts off with a heavy message. And then it goes from a heavy message into a song that is a lament. And it's actually a parody of a lament. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, and a lament, of course, is a song that is sung uh, at the passing of a famous figure. And uh, it is usually a song that uh, expresses the grief and the sorrow and the loss involved in this death. And God is going to use that form of poetry or that form of music uh, to teach us a different lesson. But the context is the same as the uh, grand finale. Uh, it is in reference to Isaiah's ministry primarily to Judah and the kings of Judah. And Judah, of course, at this time under King Ahaz is under a tremendous amount of pressure. Pressure from Israel, their, their brothers across the border to the north and then a, a little bit further north still, Syria. And Syria and Israel are threatening uh, Judah. And of course, uh, they will also eventually be threatened by Assyria, an even bigger empire. And so Ahaz is confronted with the need to do something in response to the threats that are on their doorstep. And the, the fact of the matter is that Israel often lived in our history in a state of imminent threat of destruction. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's still going on today. Our neighbors want to destroy us, want to push us into the sea. And Israel at that time was also surrounded by hostile neighbors, as I just said. And they were in, at threat of not only, uh, not just destruction, but if not destruction, then ruthless domination and somebody uh, taking advantage of them economically and socially and repressing them, et cetera, et cetera. They had Egypt and Cush on the south. They had Tyre on the west. They had Syria, Assyria, and eventually Babylon on the east. And it's easy to imagine the chronic angst, the chronic angst that would have been experienced by especially the leadership of Israel and then as well the people of Israel. And I think that we can all relate to that angst, can't we? Because there are lots of things that are going on in our lives on a regular basis that threaten our well-being, that threaten the well-being not only of ourselves personally, but perhaps of our family, of somebody we know, somebody we love, somebody close to us. We are constantly uh, dealing with the fact that, that death is, is drawing ever closer to us, whether we like it or not. There's nothing we can do uh, to forestall that. Uh, we look around us, as I've spoken often about in the, in the last several weeks, is that we look around at, at the way our society and our world is going, and we see forces of evil rising up and when we see them dominating, that causes that same kind of angst. Where are we going to find protection for ourselves, for the people that we love? And so this morning's text, Isaiah chapter 13 and 14, again speaks to the angst that Ahaz and Judah's leadership would have been feeling at this time under the circumstances that uh, they were living. And so we want to be thinking through this text in terms of what does Isaiah teach us about dealing with the temptation to trust something or someone other than God when we feel threatened. Can you relate to that? I, I want to encourage you to just take a second and think, what is it that is currently causing 
angst in your life? What is it that is a threat to you? What is it that is a threat to your well-being or the well-being of your family or the well-being of the society in which you live that has you concerned and anxious? And I want you to hold that in mind as we look at this text because Isaiah does have something to teach us about dealing with the temptation to trust something or someone other than God in the midst of those kinds of, uh, those kinds of pressures in our lives. And so what, what does he teach us? So Isaiah teaches us that when we're tempted to trust something or someone other than God, Isaiah calls us to learn from the future. <laughs> to learn from the future. We normally talk about learning from the past, right? But that's not what Isaiah is going to do in this text. He is going to be pointing to the future. Some aspects of what he's going to speak of are almost 200 years in the future. And so can you imagine if I were trying to encourage you by saying, well, I want you to look ahead to see what's going to happen in the future in order to find grace today to not put your trust in anything or anyone other than than God in the midst of the trials that you're facing today. And yet that is what Isaiah himself is doing. And so this morning we do have some home links. Uh, they've been uh, printed for you and they'll be available. I'm just gonna put them up on the screen briefly so you can get an idea of what they look like. They are available uh, in the back if you've not already received uh, one, of the, one of the slips with them printed on it. And we'd encourage you to take this home with you, take it out to lunch with you and don't wrap leftovers in it, but actually use it to have a conversation about what God said in his word and how it might apply to the circumstances of your life. And then of course next week, we always encourage you to be reading ahead so that the text is not brand new to you when you get here on Shabbat, uh, to go ahead and read Isaiah chapter 14, verse 28 through Isaiah 16, verse 14. And so, how is it, what do we learn from Isaiah? What does Isaiah teach us? And so what he teaches us is to learn from the future, to learn from the future. And so since we're, look, we're covering two chapters, I'm gonna break our main points up into those two chapters, okay? And so the first thing that Isaiah wants us to learn from the future is that human prideful kingdoms don't last. I mean, that, that's the basic fundamental message of Isaiah chapter 13. And so even if some of the details may confuse us or may be obscure to us because we don't understand the culture or the literature uh, of that time, the message is simple, that, that human prideful kingdoms don't last. They don't last. And so look with me if, at our text at chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, where it says, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. And so Isaiah, in writing his text, he wants to make sure that we know that this is something he wrote. And so if he is the one who wrote it, it had to be written within the time of his ministry. And so it becomes important because the things of which he will speak in this oracle, or burden is another translation of the same word, is something that is going to happen future to his own day. And so it says an oracle, or a burden, or like I said in my introduction, a heavy message. This is a weighty message. This is not a feel good, we win, we're the victors, end of the play finale. This is a heavy message in the middle of the play. And it is a message about God's judgment, a, a message of God's judgment. But he says here concerning Babylon. Now for us, we read this and we go, oh yeah, Babylon. They're the ones who finally came down in 586 BC and destroyed Jerusalem and took the Jewish people captive. Yeah, sure, we know Babylon. But we forget to remember that that is quite a bit in the future to Isaiah's own day. And yet here is Isaiah speaking about Babylon. And so in Ahaz's day, 
Babylon was not a huge political power yet. The city existed and it was a hub in some sense of culture and things like that, but it was not associated with great political power. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the events described by Isaiah are 193 years future to his own day. If, if we use Isaiah chapter 7 verse 1 and his conversation with Ahaz as a time marker, the things that he describes about Babylon and what will happen to Babylon happen almost 200 years forward in the time. And that's, that's pretty crazy. So it's like somebody standing up at the signing of the Declaration of Independence and telling us what was going to be happening in 1976 and say, this has import for you today. You should learn something from this today. And so that's what he's saying. And so why Babylon though? Why Babylon? Well, we know from history because of how God is going to use Babylon. But it's even more than that. The very idea, the very concept, the very word or name or title, Babylon has an important meaning and paints an important picture that we need to understand in order to understand the scope and the import of the text that is before us this morning. And so why Babylon? The reason he mentions Babylon and the reason he's going to speak and prophesy and tell us in advance what God is going to do to Babylon is that Babylon is a prototype, is the prototype, the prototype of humankind's pride and rejection of God and attempt at self-rule apart from God's kingdom and God's king. You got that? It's very important to understand that because it helps us understand why Isaiah writes some of the things that he writes. It's a prototype. And so what do I mean by prototype? If we go back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, go turn with me or uh, you can use your electronic device, whatever you call it. Uh, you don't call it turn with me. What do you say? Swipe, swipe with me. Uh, back to um, uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, where it says this. It says, the beginning of his kingdom, and this is in reference to Nimrod, one of the descendants of uh, Cush. And so it says, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Babel, or Babylon would be another way to translate that word would be Babylon and it mentions several cities there but the first one that is mentioned is Babylon and what's really important to know is that the word kingdom guess how many times it's used before this in the scriptures nuns zero it's not used at all and so this is the very first mention of a human kingdom the kingdom of Babylon and so it goes on, the text goes on, in fact, in chapter 11 of Genesis. Look with me, if you will, there at 11 verses 1 through 4. And it says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and of course, this is all just post-flood and the repopulation of the earth after Noah's days. It says, and it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. So even, even the materials that they were gonna build their capital city out of were man-made materials. Not even the materials that God provides. These were man-made materials. And he says, and they said, and they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And we know from the rest of the story that God did not approve of that plan. 
that he wanted to stop mankind from being able to do that in unity because he knew ultimately it was not good for us. But here is Babylon or Babel is the very prototype of man's sinful desire to rule himself apart from God's rule over him. And so it's reinforced in verse four where it says, make a name for ourselves. And what's so important is when you juxtapose their desire to make a name for themselves with what God says to, the, to our father Abram. Our father Abram in chapter 12 verse two, when he calls him and he gives him this glorious vision of the promise that he was going to make to him in giving him a, a people and a land and a blessing, he says to Abraham in that context, I will make your name great. I will, so here is, we will make a name for ourselves and God's plan, I will make your name great. And you see the conflict that is going on. And so when we speak of Babylon here in chapter 13, we must keep that picture in our minds. And so Babylon is that prototypical idea of a sinful human kingdom raised up against God's kingdom and God's rule in our lives. And so it explains in our text the, some of the universal language that Isaiah employs in the description of the events uh, that he lays out for us. Look with me, if you will, quickly at uh, just to, so you understand what I mean by universal language. Uh, look with me at chapter 13 in Isaiah, verses 11 and following. It says, Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. The world? And this is not the word Eretz, which can mean land as well as world. This is a different Hebrew word that means world. The, the, he, that God created the world and everything, what? In it, that's the same word that it's used here. It says, so I will judge the world for their iniquity and I will put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. You see, there's, there's a cosmic picture here and we need to understand why that is the case. And so, Babylon points us to all forms of human pride that would establish kingdoms and kings apart from God. Got that? It's important to understand that as we begin to look at the text. And so Isaiah is going to tell us that we want to learn from the future because what the future is going to tell us is that human kingdoms don't last. Human kingdoms don't last. And so he's going to explain that to us in chapter 13, verses 2 through uh, 22. And in verses 2 through 5, what we learn about the kingdoms not lasting is that they don't just fall. Now, remember, we think about the rise and fall of what? The Roman Empire, the rise and fall of Nazi Germany, the rise and fall of the Taliban, etc., etc. But that's not what this text tells us. It isn't as if... Babylon rose and fell of its own weight. It was judged and all human prideful kingdoms come under the judgment of God eventually. Look at, look at verse three, it says, or verse two, it says, lift up a standard on the bare hill. Raise your voice to them, wave the hand that they may enter the doors of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones, that is those who are set apart from my job. He says, I have even called my mighty warriors, my proudly exalting ones. He'll tell us a little bit later in the text who he's referring to. Uh, to execute my anger, to execute my anger. And then in verse three, he said, I have commanded my consecrated ones. This is God's action and God's anger that's at stake. In verse five, the end of verse five, it says the Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. And so this is something that God is doing. And the reason that human, sinful human kingdoms don't last is because they are judged ultimately by God himself. 
Then in verses six through 13, uh, Isaiah tells us that these man-made, prideful, sinful kingdoms fall because God judges mankind's pride and his attempt at self-rule. It, it isn't, it's not like he's threatened by their power. He's not threatened by their wealth. But he cannot stand by and allow our human hubris to go unchallenged. Not because it costs him anything, but because it costs us everything if we fall prey to it. And so he goes on and he explains that it is going to be mankind's sinfulness in his pride at self-rule that God has at heart here in this judgment. Look with me, if you will, at verse 6 and 9. You see, it says, Well, for the day of the Lord is near. And so when he says the day of the Lord is near, it sounds to us like near in time. But that's not really the full implication of the Hebrew here because the implication is it's near in that it is for fully prepared. It's ready to go. That's the emphasis here. It's ready to go. And so he says that the the day of the Lord is near. And then again uh, in verse 9 it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And so the biblical title for the judgment that will eventually fall on all sinful kingdoms or prideful kingdoms is the day of the Lord. And so this little graphic shows you uses of the day of the Lord. And the first and the earliest use in the prophets is right here in Isaiah uh, chapter 13 verses six and nine. And and it's a picture of battle. It's mentioned in Jeremiah uh, where the sword is prominent In Ezekiel, we have pictures of clouds and doom and Joel. We have locusts and judgment and Amos. We have darkness and Obadiah. Uh, We have uh, uh, drinking uh, continually, which is a a sign of of God's wrath as well. Uh, In Zephaniah, we have sacrifice, not the kind as unto God. Uh, And, uh, of course, in Malachi, it speaks of the messenger of the Lord who comes with uh, the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord is, is biblical shorthand. It's Bible speak for God acting in judgment. And it, it doesn't matter because sometimes the day of the Lord <clears throat> is spoken of in reference to God's judgment of his people Israel. But most of the time it is spoken of in reference to God's judgment of sinful rulers and kingdoms who have set themselves up in pride against him. And so the day of the Lord is, is near. It's ready to go. And then uh, in verse 10, look at verse 10. It says, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will, will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. And so here again is a picture of, of uh, he's using the physical elements to describe the kind of terror that is going to take place at the time of the Lord's judgment. And what's interesting is that it's also, this whole idea is parallel to what Yeshua spoke of in Mark chapter 13, verse 24, and in other gospels, where he was talking about after the tribulation and when God will come, when Messiah will return with the armies of heaven in order to judge the nations of the world who have amassed themselves against God and against his people and against his land. And so it's the same kind of cataclysmic eschatological judgment that is pictured here for us. The judgment is universal as I mentioned before in verse 11. Uh, That whole idea that it's the whole world and not simply the land that falls under his judgment. And then we won't take the time to unpack all of this, but but just I want you to note that verses 14 to 16, uh, it tells us that the judgment is complete. The judgment is complete. It, It draws this picture that none of the people of the kingdom will survive. Everybody will fall under God's judgment. 
And then in verses 17 to 22, it says that, that its judgment is complete, not only in that all of the people will fall under God's judgment, but that the very seed of power will be destroyed as well. So you've got the people and the place, and it's a theme we're going to see come up in the second half as well. And so, so what does Isaiah have to teach us about the temptation to trust something or someone else? What's, what's the message to Israel? The message to Israel is don't worry about them and don't worry about these other kingdoms and don't look to them for help and don't look to political solutions for help or any other man-made solution for help because none of that is going to last. None of that is going to last. And I'm just amazed, constantly amazed at myself of how often and how quickly I look first and foremost for a human solution to whatever it is that is a problem in my life, uh, to whatever fear I am encountering. And Tim was a great example of that this morning in getting the news that out of nowhere his contract was not going to be renewed and not for any fault of his own, uh, but simply because of the circumstances that the school was operating under at the time, that he could have sent himself off in all different kinds of directions. But his first, first thought was, no, my hope is in the Lord. My help comes from him. My hope is in his kingdom and not this world. And so... Basically, how does it apply? It applies to us in that, that we don't want to be trusting in them. We don't want to be looking to invest in this world and this kingdom as if it's going to give us stability and hope. I know we, we, all, we all want to own a nice home or rent a nice home and we want stability. There's nothing wrong with stability. I'm not, I'm not dissing stability. But what I'm trying to get at is what God was trying to get at for Israel is that there is no hope there. There is no hope anywhere but in me. And in fact, it's the same message that the author of Hebrews uh, gives the Jewish believing community to whom he is writing. And look, look at what he says in chapter 12 of Hebrews beginning with verse 25. He says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens." This expression yet once more denotes removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. You think maybe he knew Isaiah? You think the author of Hebrews understood the message of Isaiah? And he is reminding all of us who know Messiah, who are trusting in Messiah, who are looking forward to the coming of his kingdom. He says, don't invest in this world alone. And isn't that exactly what Jesus said? Don't lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up your treasure in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? And so it is a reminder that where, what are we sowing to? Where is our trust? Where is our confidence? Is it in human institutions? Is it, is it in the government? Uh, is it in the UN to bring world peace? All of those things are false hopes because they are all human prideful attempts to establish a peaceful rule and a peaceful kingdom on earth apart from trusting the living God and looking for his kingdom, his kingdom. And so 
Isaiah speaks clearly to the temptation to trust something or someone other than God for protection and, and direction. And so he goes on though, and he doesn't end there. He not only does he say that, that kingdoms don't last, he tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, he says, learn from the future because human kings don't last. So that's what chapter 13 was all about, the destruction of the Babylonian kingdom and its emblematic nature of the destruction of all prideful human attempts to establish a peaceful reign or on this earth. And he goes on in chapter 14 and he talks about the fate of prideful kings, the fate of prideful kings. And so look with me, if you will, at the opening verses. Uh, you'll notice that, at least in the New American Standard, um, the indentation is different on verses one through three than it is on four and following, because one through three, uh, or three or four A, is prose, whereas the rest of it is um, uh, poetry, the lyrics of a song. And so the context of the song about which we will read is this, it says, when the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of the Lord. And we think all the way back to the beginning of Isaiah, come let us go up to the house of the Lord, et cetera, et cetera, that that day is coming, the establishment of God's kingdom, the ascendancy of Israel as the place of God's rule and reign and the drawing of the faithful from the nations to worship God at Jerusalem. And that's the picture again that he's reminding them of here. In verse two, he says, the peoples will take them along and bring them to their place, meaning help uh, the Jewish people who are dispersed throughout the world to return. And the house of Israel will possess them meaning the nations and the people of the nations as an inheritance in the land of the Lord as male servants and female servants and they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. So basically he's saying it's gonna be a complete inversion of the way things are. And so even after he gives this picture of the destruction of all sinful, prideful human kingdoms, including the ones that Israel itself tried to establish, he says there's coming a time when you will be restored to the land after they are destroyed, you will be restored to the land and you will sing a song. That's what he says in verse three. He says, and it will be in that day, in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you will take up, and the NASB says, um, taunt against the king of Babylon and say. And what the, the word, this word taunt uh, is the same word we get proverb from. And so it's a proverbial song. In other words, it's got a proverbial message. There's something we're to learn from this song of a practical nature. And he goes on and he gives us this song and it's a lament. And so if you study ancient Near Eastern literature, you can read uh, these lament poems that were written in honor of the death of a great king or a great leader, a great military leader. And they are structured a certain way and they usually talk about uh, the leader's death and its impact and the grief of the different parts of society and things like that and how much he's gonna be missed. But that's not what this lament is. This lament is a parody of a lament. This is a lament that says, no, good riddance to the one who died. That's the message. The message is a very simple message, is that human prideful kings don't last. And just like human prideful kingdoms, they come under the judgment of God. And so the, it is broken down into four stanzas, if you will. And the first stanza, comes in, uh, let's see, comes in verses four through eight. And so let, look with me just at the opening, uh, at the second half of verse four. How the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. And again, look, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers 
which used to strike the peoples with fury, with unceasing strokes, strokes which subdued the nations in anger, with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, sing, since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes against us. All right, so that's the first picture. So the first picture is that even the earth is gonna rejoice at your death. That's the lament. That's first stanza of, of, of lament is that even the earth is going to rejoice and the trees of Lebanon are there as, as an example because the kings of Assyria and the kings of Babylon and other invading nations would come into Lebanon where they have these gorgeous cedar trees and would cut them down and take wood back to beautify their own palaces and temples or they would take that same wood and use it to build engines of war to wreak havoc on Israel. And so it says, the first part of the lament is, even the earth is happy, you're dead. Then it goes on, and part two comes in verses nine through 11. And this is a picture of what the underworld happens to think. This is what death thinks about their death. It's, it's a striking picture. It says, uh, Sheol, that is the place of the dead, from beneath is excited over you, to meet you when you come. It, ar it arouses for you in the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They will all respond and say to you, even you have been made weak as we, for we have, you have become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps. Now, now you gotta get that picture. Your pomp and the music of your harps. And so this, I want you to think of a, of a royal feastal procession and the king being carried on this beautiful beer, you know, this beautiful float, you know, adorned with gold and, and ivory and surrounded by, you know, servants and warriors and wives and, and music playing all in celebration of the king being present, right? And he says, and so then he flips this thing around and he says, your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol, death, the place of the dead. Maggots are spread at your, as your bed beneath you and worms are your covering. <laughs> that is a gross picture. But what, what is it? What's it a picture of? That all that pomp and circumstance, all the power, all the authority, you ruled over us, you beat us to death, you took advantage of, you bragged at how greater you were than we were, and now you're right down here with us. And so death is going, no. <laughs> we're, you know, you got your comeuppance. And then part three comes from verses 12 to 15. And it says this, this is, this is the, this is heaven's response. So you've, you've got the earth's response, you've got what's below the earth, the place of the dead's response, and now you've got heaven's response up above. And he says, how you have fallen from heaven. O star of the morning, sun of the dawn, you have cut down, you've been cut down uh, to the earth, you have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I, so here's a picture of the heart of the matter. This is, this, is, this is the spirit of Babylon. This is the spirit that is represented by what happened at the Tower of Babel. This is the spirit that resides in every human heart apart from the grace of God. You got that? Every human heart, yours and mine. And he says this, he says, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. And that's an ancient Near Eastern depiction of the place of power and rule and authority. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so he says that's the attitude. That's the attitude. It's the attitude of the garden, isn't it? It's the attitude that drove Adam and Eve to take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and to eat from it. And God, Satan said to them, no, God's afraid of you because when you eat it, you're gonna be like him. 
And you think, well, that's not true. He lied to them. No, it is true because God says, what should we do about it since they have eaten and have become like one of us? So it is man's grasp, our grasp to dethrone the king. And heaven responds and he says, nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to death to the recesses of the pit. And of course, we read in Revelation about that ultimate pit of fire, uh, etc., and the, and the destruction of death itself. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All the kings of the nations. I'm sorry, I, I got into the next part. <laughs> I'm sorry. It ends at verse 15. That for nevertheless you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So you wanted to ascend to heaven? No. You end up rotting in hell. That's the basic picture. And then section 4 is verses 16 to 21. And this is uh, the living's response. So we have the earth's response, we have the dead's response, we have heaven's response, and now we have the living's response, those are who are living on the earth. And he goes on and he says, those who see you will gaze at you will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who took kingdoms, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, okay? And so this is, this is the living looking at what happens to the king of Babylon. And they're saying, look, even all of these other kings were honored in their death. And they were buried in a tomb and they left a progeny, they left a people behind them and he says no you are judged and you your body will be desecrated in death and you will not have a progeny you will not have a people coming behind you and you will not even have a place to call your own anymore that is called your nation I'm going to jump all the way down to verse 22 says I will rise up against them declares the Lord of hosts I will cut off from Babylon name and survivors offspring and posterity declares the Lord so so God saying I am going to cut off all the people and this is in reference to the king all your people and then he says I will also make it meaning Babylon the city the nation it a possession for the hedgehog and the swamps of water and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord. He's not going to have a people, and he's not going to have a place. Not going to have a people and a place. And now, I just want to grab these last few verses, because here God gives an application of what, a near application of what is going to happen almost 200 years in the future, here he talks about something that is going to happen 31 years later. The Lord of hosts has sworn saying, surely just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand to break Assyria in my land. And so now he's changing to Assyria. He says, I am going to do what I just described to you will happen in 200 years. You're going to know that that's going to happen in 200 years because of what's going to happen about 31 years from now when you see me destroy Assyria. You can count on this. To break Assyria in my land, I will trample on him on my mountains. Uh, and that's described for us later in the book of Isaiah. Then his yoke will be removed from them and his burdens removed from their shoulder. And then he finishes with these words. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has planned and who can frustrate it? As for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Right? Whose plan survives? God's alone. Whose kingdom survives? God's alone. Whose king survives? God's alone. 
And so when we find ourselves in the midst of whatever that trial is, whatever that you imagined at the beginning of the service, and you are tempted to look for other solutions to your problem, are you coming to God first? Are you recognizing first and foremost that you have you have lived your life to a certain point and perhaps for some today to this day in that spirit of Babylon in that spirit of I want to be the boss of my life and I am going to build for myself a kingdom here on this earth to turn away from that foolishness because God says it's not going to last you will face God's judgment and the glorious news in the rest of Isaiah is that God has a solution to that and it's going to be his servant who is going to suffer and die as an atoning sacrifice for his people and for all who would trust in him. So the first step in recognizing that kingdoms don't last and kings don't last except God's kingdom and except God's king is to get right with the king. To get right with the king. And then once you have been made right before God through faith in his Messiah to begin to live for his king and not for yourself to begin to live for his kingdom and not for yourself and to encourage and challenge your children to live for the kingdom that is going to last to challenge them to live for the king who will live forever and rule and reign in justice justice and righteousness and peace and to pour out our lives as the book of Hebrews told us to as an act of service to the kingdom that will not be shaken and to the king who will never die. What do we do when we find ourselves threatened and in angst? We look to the future and we learn from the future. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this uh, amazing passage, Lord. I know I, some people are probably feeling like they've been drinking out of a fire hose and we have been. Uh, but we get the message, Lord. Help us to get the message. Help us to take it to heart. Help us to first get right with you, Lord, and to repent, confess that spirit of, that Babylon spirit of self-rule, and to humble ourselves before you and to seek your King, our Messiah. And Lord, help us to look to the future and to learn from it and to walk today in whatever crisis we might find ourselves in, in light of the kingdom that lasts forever and the king who rules forever in love. Lord, we thank you. We commit to you in Yeshua's name. Amen.